Yeah, welcome back to The Breakfast on PLOS TV Africa. We sincerely apologize for the break. We had some technical issues that have now been addressed. And now we are joined by Mr. Ezekiel Iya Etok, and he would be speaking with us uh, to discuss Leah Sharibu. She was one of the schoolgirls, the over 100 schoolgirls who was abducted, you know, in February 2018. And uh, she's the only one of the adopted schoolgirls that are yet to, you know, be reunited with her family. And, uh, you know, that's an account of a Christian faith. And news reaching us confirms that she has given birth to a second child, a baby boy, in the terrorist captivity. So we're now inviting Ms. Ayetok uh, to help us make sense of this very sad news. Good morning again, Ms. Ayetok, and thanks for joining us. Good morning. Always a pleasure to be with you. So happy to be back. I don't know why. <laughs> Good to have thanks you to again. Us. So this issue of Leah Sharibu has been lingering for over two years now. And ever since, you know, her abduction, we've seen terrorists or bandits, as they're now called, you know, kidnap girls in their hundreds. And we see how the government speedily rescue them. But for Leah Sharibu, the story hasn't been the same and her family is still shattered over this incident. How do you think they might actually be feeling, you know, seeing how other people have been released and how their little girl is still in captivity? It's, it's unfortunately the tale of two countries. The story of Lear is one that um, I find it very difficult to understand. Even from what you may call good politics, the, the, our leaders, unfortunately, uh, at the highest level, the presidency, don't have strategic thinkers. You know, when you run an administration, even for your selfish purpose, there are things you go out of your way. You use a sledgehammer to kill a fly, uh, just to make a statement. We are in a country where there's so much talk about um, clannishness. We are talking so much about nepotism. We are talking of so much about the divides between the North, the South, the Christian, the Muslim. Everything is divisive. Everything is in the negative. It's so much in the public space that I expected that there are certain things that Mr. President will go out of his way to do just to make a point. You know, uh, the, you know there's somewhere in the Bible where Paul said, some preach the gospel just to add source to my injuries. And I don't care. The bottom line is that the gospel is being preached. A point has come that even if it's just to make a point, that look, I am a father of all the people in this country, particularly the children. I don't care if Leah is a Christian, she is my daughter, I'm being the only one, and on account of her faith, being held back, I will leave no stone unturned to mm -hmm. get her. The international communities have run with it. I don't know if Mr. President and his advisors are aware of the, the, the ratings and the narratives outside this country with respect to the person of our president and religion and the fact that when you become a president, you become a father of all. You become a father of PDP, of um, ADC, of um, APC, you become the father of the North, the South, the Igbo, the uh, Anangs. You become the father of all. You become the father figure where we find solace in. Why on earth will Mr. President allow Lia Sharibu, not just that she was one of the girls, but that she was the Christian girl that refused to denounce her faith on account of which her classmates have testified that this was it. Wasn't that an awesome opportunity for it to say this country is a secular state? And for this singular reason, you know, if this country had a policy of non-negotiation with the bandits, I can understand. I can understand. Because, I mean, sometimes 
policies have to be hard and they have consequences. But when you see that they are asking for amnesty, they are paying ransoms, I'm told, they are doing negotiations, I'm told, they are doing swap deals, I'm told, when you see that all these things are in the mix, definitely these people have a price tag on Ye Sharibu. All right. And, you know, the country, they've allowed that price tag to go so high. But even with that, I believe that with Intel, with strategy, this is one thing that even the... I wish I was with the National Security Advisor. Uh, Ms. This Ms. is Ayatollah, one uh, rescue operation that would just take the, 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 the rating of this, this government to the highest heaven. Because, you know, the higher the stake, the higher the things that come with it. Ms. Ayatollah, As at this uh, time... Permit, permit me to step in. Yeah, go, go ahead. Um, go ahead. You know, I'm not even sure if we should still be talking about a rescue operation. Uh, if we if we've looked at the you know way that the others have been released you know in the you yeah. know, last you know couple of years we've seen kidnap of boys yeah. we've seen kidnap of girls um, we've seen Sheikh Gumi even speaking yeah. on behalf of you know these bandits and you know Boko Haram and, yeah. and the likes um, I don't think yeah. we should even I think you know we've we've been able to establish that people can be released without an actual rescue operation um, either we agree that that um, um, Ransom is being paid, or we continue to uh, disagree that it is being paid. Well, but you know, I'm sure that Lesha Group can be rescued if we were serious about rescuing her or bringing her back home. Something I want you to speak on is we're speaking this morning on the second pregnancy. Lesha Ribu was 14 when she was kidnapped. It's expected that February this year she turns 17. It doesn't seem to be you know, a big problem in Nigeria today that this child is not even old enough, is not even seen as an adult yet, yet we are speaking about a second child. Why do you think that is, you know, that is the way it is? Why do you feel, you know, that we, we've spoken about this and we're going to move on tomorrow as if nothing really is shocking about the fact that a 17-year-old is giving birth to a second child in captivity? It should be described as rape, isn't it? <laughs> uh, I, I, I wish, I, wish I, I, I could cry openly. But let me tell you something that we need to... That's what we need to move into, what I call cerebral governance. These, these, these captors, these, these uh, militia or militants or abductors are smart people. Lee Sharibu has become a gold mine for them. As a result, they need to up the ante at all times. They need to create the news at all times. They need to do things, they need to leak reports to bring the narrative up. And the longer that she stays, the higher the price until it reaches maybe a crescendo and probably starts to decline. A time is going to come when we're like, okay, let's move on. But for now, she is still very commercial. So having the first child brought her back to the news and everybody was talking about it. Having the second child ups the ante. So they couldn't have stopped at the first child. They have to go to the second child. But this is a young girl that we are keeping quiet and watching her being merchandised being abused, being subjected to this very inhuman treatment. This is a 17-year-old child talking of, you know, it's like babies making babies, talking of a second child. And yet, on a daily basis, we are keeping quiet. When I say we, I'm talking of the government. You know, a time had reached where there was a seeming diversion of attention. That was the time you know, the way these, these abductors operate, they look for matters of the moment. And with time, if our security operatives were working good intel about a year ago or some months back, they would have struck a very successful rescue operation. Because by today, they ought to know where she is. We watch movies where people go into prison 
get tortured, get beaten, just to be able to get certain in information, certain intel, and when they come out, they are able to relate that intel and for government to strike. Do you know that even if it meant paying a guy 50 million, do you understand me, to infiltrate their ranks and be one of their guys just to be giving information to the government, they will be able to tell you where this lady is. They will tell you how they operate. They will tell you where they, because they are always blind spots. They are always in every situation. And then the army would have been able to launch an amazing, you know, successful rescue operation. And the whole nation will forget and forgive. You see, Nigeria is a country that just do one good thing. And they'll forget all your sins. Hmm. Mr. Yeto. Mr. Abdul Salam, let me just end on this. Mr. Abdul Salam Abubakar, general, is hailed. Why? One action, handing over to the civilian. Our, president, our former president, Jonathan, is hailed globally for one action. What was it? Failing to sit tight in office. Okay? There's one action that President Buhari will take, and everybody will forget his sins, forget his past. Apart from, of course, giving us credible electoral um, act and immediately. That's one thing he could do. He's delaying on it. Give us Le Sharibu. He's delaying on it. These are one-point actions that wipe out all your sins. And I hope they are thinking. I, I, well, hmm. I don't know about that. We've seen in other parts of the world where, you know, people are kidnapped. And one way to get them freed, you know, apart from the other options like, you know, ransom payments and, you know, uh, rescue is prisoner exchange where you have someone from the terrorist side or from the opponent side and you get your man in exchange for theirs. I remember that some time ago, an American pastor had volunteered to you know, be exchanged in place for Leah Sharibu, but we didn't hear anything else from that story. And we keep hearing statements from the army about Boko Haram insurgents that were killed, that were, that, that were neutralized, Boko Haram subjects that were captured. Why have we not looked at prisoner exchange, at least, just to get Leah Sharibu back to safety? You want me to be very honest with you? Please go ahead. You want me to be very honest with you? You want me to be very honest with you and Nigerians? Yes, sir. Guys, couldn't be bothered. I couldn't care less about me. I'll say that with every sense of responsibility. They couldn't care less. If Mr. President wants Lee Sharibu out this week, by this weekend, you see, we understand the mindset of these people. What do they want? They want money, they want fame. They want money, they want fame. They don't have anything on Lea Shari. They couldn't care about her as an individual. They don't care. They don't have, I mean, they have too many women around. They have too many women around. But we have inadvertently allowed Lea to become a very amazing bargaining tool. There's something that you tell those abductors today and they'll release her within 24 hours. Imagine that they released 300 300 students within days and they paid nothing. What makes Lie alone more important, more commercial than 300 students released without as a sign of goodwill? If they wanted to give, do goodwill, isn't it even easier to release one person? Well, I thank God for the 300. But I want to tell you that if these people want Lea Sharibu out today, they can do it. It's very easy. Call their leadership. They have access. These are people that they say we are talking with and all those things. And you see, like I said earlier today, there's a man called um, um, uh, uh, Sheikh Gumi that I, I once on a program I referred to him as um, um, a respected you know, uh, cleric. But these days, I wish that, that, that this cleric will show himself as a nationalist and say, I'm taking up Ye Sharibu's case today. And I want to tell Nigerians that this girl, I'm going to ensure her release as a sign of goodwill for people to know that these people should be listened to.
if get we, her out. Get her out. If we can so easily follow up and get information about Leah Sheribu anytime she's pregnant and anytime she gives birth, isn't that already one step into you know being able to know exactly where she is and bring and getting her out? I mean, they if, know if where there is information. Is. Exactly. If, there is, if there's information about her um, giving birth or being pregnant, it means that there is midwives in the forest or in captivity, wherever she is, that assisted her uh, through the pregnancy and, of course, uh, through her childbirth. Um, isn't that already clear that the Nigerian government knows where this young girl is? My brother, quote me. They know where she is. They know how she is. They know what these people want, but I doubt that they care. But let me say something, because at the end of the day, we're all people of faith, and I'm a Christian. I want to say that Leah is where she is because there's a plan for her life. That sounds very unsympathetic. You know, there was a time that the three Hebrew children had to be thrown into the lion's den, okay? And... Uh, some of them had to be thrown into the fire. People have had to go through things. But God has not been asleep. There was a time that I had a dream. And I'm still writing down that dream. About meeting Leah Sharibu and the things that she said. And they challenged me as a man who has been a Christian born again for centuries, for ages. I felt small. I felt like a little child. Leah has become an object of inspiration to Christians around the world. Rather than dampen the spirit of Christians, Leah has challenged people like myself to ask you, are you really a Christian? What do you really believe? What do you stand for when push comes to quack? Can you stand like Leah and say, hey, look, look, for me to live is Christ and for me to die is gain. Can I say that? Leah is an inspiration to me every day I wake up. Whether she dies today, God forbid, I believe that in the fullness of time, God, who is the, the, the sovereign, who has the capacity. You know, sometimes we, we call God so much that we have trivialized, like the name of Jesus, you hit your leg against, your foot against, they dash your foot against, oh, Jesus. You know, something happens, with Jesus. You know, we've so trivialized it that we think that the power is lost. No. God still has that power, that capacity, and he is still cooking. And by the time he's done, the Bible is very clear. He says, had he known, he would not have crucified the God of glory. Had the abductors known, hmm. they would never have abducted Leah. Leah might come up to be the end of terrorism within that context in this country. Let me tell you something. Oh, well. I've learned... The Bible says that he does all things well in his time. God is not asleep, no matter what we say about him. This girl stood up for God, and she's become a global template okay. for the fact that you can stand for what you believe. Is it and for yeah, me, that is awesome. You know, along the lines of what you've been saying about, you know, what Leah stands for, I recall in 2019, the Guardian newspaper, you know, described her as the goddess of resistance. So really, to a lot of people, she's an inspirational figure. You know, uh, you know what Malala, you know, is to lots of people in, in her part of the world. Leah Sherebu represents that for, for, the, for the rest of us. But you mentioned something earlier I would like us to really harp on. You said, the government knows where Leah Sherebu is and they know what the terrorists want. What could they want in exchange for her? <laughs> you see, the terrorist can always speak at another person, okay? But now they have a high, a high value product. So they are only, how can we milk this product as much as possible? Number one, they will tell you, give us money. Humongous amount of money. Number two, they will tell us, do a certain level of swap exchange. These are the two things. Any other thing is something give us a territory. Of course, nobody will listen to them for that. But they don't care about territory. These are merchants. Give us, number one, give us money. Stupendous, humongous amount of money. Because the stake is really high. And number two, let's do a kind of swap for this or that. They can also add certain sweeteners. Don't 
come and do this, don't do that. But these are the two main things they will ask for any day. And what do you do with them? Number one, keep the conversation. I mean, it's getting a little late and some things probably are not good said on air. But we have strategies and strategic incas. These are people that can tell the government what to do. But the question is, what does government want? It's not what do the terrorists want. What does government want? Unless you understand what President Buhari wants concerning Lia Sharibu, all this discussion is like pouring water on a fowl's back. The fowl will just shake the water off and move on. So my question is, is President Buhari willing to say today, I want Lia Sharibu? Imagine President Buhari telling the people that for Easter, my Easter message is to tell Christians, hold on to your faith. Muslims, hold on to your faith. And my message to Christians at Easter is to give them back Lia Sharibu. He will... Lia Sharibu will be, by tomorrow, she will be waiting in government house, recuperating and feeling good to be presented as, a, 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 as an Easter gift. And I think that the President should think of what I've just said. Okay. It's possible. Right. Look well, at her. Just pretty, look at this. Pretty clear. Just look at the innocence. Pretty look clear at the that, um, Look at the resilience. Well, uh, um, it's pretty clear, as you can talk, that, uh, well, thank you for your, your, your thoughts so far. Uh, Nigeria did fail Lea Sheribu, and of course, um, those thousands of others who have lost their lives, um, either in captivity or through the violence that, you know, have come through bandits and insurgents and herders and however else you want to describe them. And we will continue to hope that uh, there is a happy ending for Lea Sheribu somehow, somewhere, and she is reunited with her family um, at some point. Thank you very much, Ezekiel Yantok, for speaking with us. Thank you again. Have a great day. Thank you. All right, and of course, uh, we're going to take a short break. When we come back, it's a few minutes to quickly speak on the warning strike, or what are the uh, strike by uh, um, uh, PASAN, I think that's what they're called. Yes, the Parliamentary Association, you know, workers, basically. It's, it's, it's a clash over, you know, we're talking about implementing the autonomy that we have enshrined in the Constitution now of the executive and judicial arms of government. That comes up after the break.